Steve, sometimes when guys are removed from the source, when they're far from Brazil or far from highly qualified instructors, it can be hard to develop your own jiu-jitsu. How did you develop your jiu-jitsu on the island of Guam? Uh, in, in 2006, I'd, this is before the Asian Open had, had started, I, I was competing in Japan and uh, the best results I got was at the All Japan Championships and I had double silvered and uh, I, I lost a really good guy. But I saw some shortcomings in my game and I knew that just going back and forth between the mainland and Japan and, and Guam to try to get good training, it just wasn't enough. I loved the island. I don't see myself uh, moving anytime soon. And it was getting expensive to travel. You know, where, where, we're, where we're at here, we're in the middle of the ocean, so for us to go anywhere, it's just, it's gonna cost you some coin. So I quickly decided that I need to have a bunch of guys here that will help push me, you know, and at the same time, help them grow as well. So I've been fortunate enough to, to, to have some really high level black belts come to the island. And, and share their jujitsu. And I'm not big on seminars. I like it when they come, stay for a week, teach class on a daily, let's see, let, see how they teach, you know, see what things they have to offer, check out their teaching style. And uh, that's helped tremendously in, in terms of upping the level of jujitsu on the island and, and getting the students exposed to that highest level of jujitsu. So uh, I've been able to have a good relationship with guys like, uh, you know, Mike Fowler, Jared Wiener, uh, JT Torres, the Autos guys, uh, just try to bring those best guys here and, uh, and not have that, that false sense of pride that some people have, like, oh, I don't need my black belt, you know, to get better. In jiu-jitsu, uh, it's like a college education. You don't want to learn from a tutor. I want to learn from a professor. And, and until you get that black belt, you're, you're, you're just a tutor. You're not, you're not learning from that higher source of, of knowledge. So, you know, it's that age old saying, like, if you, you want to be a world champion, hang out with other world champions. And, and uh, that's, that's taken us to where we are now. And you run a purebred gym, which was started by Ensign Inoue. How does Ensign fit into your life and your academy? Ensign was the first guy that really took time out of his life to share jujitsu with me and with the rest of the guys on the island. So he was very instrumental in not just not not only just sharing but really opening our eyes up to like what real hard training was i thought i was training hard and when i met ensign i was playing patty cake the whole time you know i wasn't training hard and he he brought that realization and that honesty into uh, you know doing it the right way if you're really going to do this you need to train train the right way and train hard do you remember any particular examples of how he showed you the hard training as you say I think the biggest lesson that I took from Ensign was that your mind will break way before your body does. So we would have some hard sparring sessions and when I look back, I, I don't even, I mean, he was putting the pressure on me, he was pounding on me, but it wasn't, I wasn't gonna die. At that moment, I felt like I was gonna die. I felt like I was very, very close to death. But, you know, afterwards he, you know, you know, uh, pat me on the head, tell me, you okay? Yeah, 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 of course you're okay, you know? And, and he taught me that, just uh, how not to break so early. You, 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 can, you, can, you can bite down and you can start to dig in and, and fight back. Tell me a little bit about some of the non-jiu-jitsu stuff that you've done with Ensign. Um, I think what people don't see with Ensign, they, they only see what the internet kind of shows and that, you know, they, they think that he's, you know, involved with the, the Yakuza or, you know, all he does is just eat candy and, 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 and play pranks on people. But I think what people don't uh, know about him is that he's a very, very generous individual and he's very big on, on, uh, on sharing and giving to people who are less fortunate than him. So he's been, he's done a number of missions uh, in the past five years to the Fukushima area. To, uh, to help those people that have literally been forgotten by the Japanese government. So he, uh, you know, with the network of academies and his, and his friends and other businesses that support his missions, he goes up there and he just gives and gives and gives and uh, uh, whatever they need, medicine, uh, clothing. Uh, he's a big pet lover. So he brings pet food up there so that he can feed the stray pets that were left in Fukushima. That's just his way of, it's not even, he's not even asking for the attention. He just does it just to do it, you know? And, and we've had these discussions about uh, feeling bad 
because you're doing something good, but you see how bad a situation they have it. So you, you, you just feel bad. Like I, I came here to feel good about helping someone, but I kind of feel bad for wanting to feel good. And just seeing that in him shows just how humble and you know how much of a softy he is inside, um, outside that out, outer hard shell of toughness. What I like about Steve Roberto's teaching is his style and how he approaches things. He makes sure you understand the concept and why you do a certain move the way you do it. It's very straightforward. He really, he really makes sure that you, you're getting it, you know? Like, you're not missing the point of jiu-jitsu, whether it be to, you know, mentally get you prepared, physically get you prepared you know, on and off the map, you know, he makes sure that you're understanding what's going on and he saw I was doing something wrong and sat down and went, okay, start over, here we go, step by step and he showed me every little detail to complete the movement and, you know, that's, that's what he does, he makes sure that you know what you're doing. He's, he's very, like, detail-oriented and stuff and I'm not a very athletic person and I'm not, you know, I've never been, but with his teaching and I think you know he, he's able to show me and uh, go into detail about how things work and you know those kind of things so about his teaching that's probably what I like the most. He's like a big brother to me since 2001 I've been under his wing and stayed with him ever since seen the academy grow I've seen Steve Roberto since he was a blue belt it is purple brown black and now it's a, a created a family you know what I mean from a me back then, so he's a leader. He's a true leader, so not enough good things to say about, about Steve Roberto. Yeah. In 2001, um, that's when I started jiu-jitsu and uh, prior to 2001 when I started, I saw a grappling tournament here on the island. I had a submission grappling tournament with Guy and I just uh, went to go check it out. I heard about it and I saw it. I saw their teams, there was only about three teams at that time competing and Purebred was basically kicking everyone's butt and I wanted to join the gym so I knew I, wanted, I was going to join. Purebred Academy, so I've been with them since ever since. Training here at Purebred, Purebred Guam is, uh, it has to be the family atmosphere. You know, like the familia, you know what I mean? It's, uh, Guam's a very small island. A lot of us are probably even related in this academy, so. And Jiu-Jitsu brings people together, but on a small island like this, it brings even the academy even tighter. You know what I mean? It's really, it's a family atmosphere. We're all brothers and sisters in here. And uh, we, take off, we, uh, we take care of each other in here. We look out for each other on and off the mat. So. The war raged for generations. No amount of bravery and conviction could end the infected, unyielding rage. And with every battle, the evil grew, changed, evolved. The warriors needed nothing short of a miracle to stop the infection, and a miracle they received. Your body is at war against skin infections and diseases each time you step onto the mat. Protect yourself against the invasion. Defense so defend what you have built. Besides Ensign Inoue, one of Steve's biggest influences is his mother, Annie Roberto. Mrs. Roberto is a survivor of World War II and offers a unique insight into the struggles of the Guamanian people that have shaped them today. So Annie, you've obviously seen many changes in Guam over your lifetime. What are your earliest memories of life on Guam? Uh, no cars, for example. Just one main highway down in the capital. People traveling mostly in um, 
carts pulled by a cow. By a cow? Or walking, just walking. Mm. We did a lot of walking. And what, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen over your lifetime here? Oh, just about everything, it seems like. Um, if I were to think about what it was like before the war, it almost seems primitive in comparison with what it is today. More people, and the population has exploded. Uh, more roads, more cars, more conveniences, people working not as hard because everything is uh, mechanized or automated, whereas we always did everything by hand. Uh, so there has been a lot of changes. There's electricity, of course, which is right. a big change. Running water. I grew up in a place where there was no electricity, no running water, so that's a big change, mm -hmm. I should say. Did you have a well? No. We had to grow water from a pump station. Oh, wow. So it sounds like you think there's, th there's been a lot of changes for the positive, but were there are also some changes for the negative. Uh, I think people have gotten lazy and spoiled. We expect too much for nothing, you know. Uh, we're not as motivated. We take too many things for granted. Uh, it used to be that life was so simple, but people look out for each other. It's like everybody's part of one family and people take care of one another. But nowadays that's not the case. It used to be that there was never any need to build a fence around your home or have a dog to guard your place. And now you have all those, but there's still crimes happening. And that's something that was really, really rare before the war. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the war. You've had some very unique experiences living through that. Can you share some of those memories with us? Mm. Well, I'd have to say more than anything else is I think I've lost my childhood. I mean, I was seven years old when the war broke out. And from seven till I was 11 when the war was over, it was all a matter of survival, you know. So uh, you didn't know from one day to the next what's going to happen to you. But um, I survive, and I, I tell this to my kids, it's going to take a lot to knock me down. If I can survive World War II, then uh, <laughs> right. What was your daily life during the occupation like? Uh, we went to school. The Japanese had all the children going to school. So we went to school. Um, we were living in Aganya, but we had a farm up in Barragada. And so we went up to the farm on a daily basis. We woke up in the morning, help out of the farm, feed the chickens. Um, watch the cornfield that the chickens don't eat up all the seedlings. And then by late afternoon, we were walking back down to Aganya again. And then when the war got worse, uh, we all left Aganya and moved up to the ranch. And then of course, after that, we went into concentration camps. So uh, we walked from Barragada to Talfofo, went from one concentration camp to another up until the uh, Americans came and liberated the island. Did you have enough food during that time? No. What were you eating? Oh, just about anything you can get your hands on. Coconuts, uh, bananas, anything that can be grown. Uh, except for that period when we were in the concentration camps and then, of course, food was very limited, but people shared whatever they had, you know. Did you lose a lot of your friends and family during the occupation, or was that not? No, not really. So life was tough, but you weren't so worried about your livelihood, your life? Um, I wasn't as a child. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, as a child, you depend on your parents to take care of you. So I guess I always thought that somebody was going to look after me. And how did it feel uh, when the island was liberated? People were happy, of course. Uh, a brand new life started. Immediately? Pretty much. We were moved uh, from the concentration camp to a village in Barragada. So people were building up villages and uh, 
people were living in more concentrated areas. They were not as scattered around as they used to be. And then, of course, uh, they built a school and the children were required to go, so things became, uh, started to become more normal again. But it was still tough, you know. So you mentioned earlier that you feel that the new generation doesn't have uh, as much appreciation as uh, maybe the older generation did. And I imagine a lot of that comes from your experiences dealing with the difficulties of, of war. Nowadays, most of us don't have to worry about war, but do you think it's good for people to have some kind of toughness, to, tough situation to deal with? You can't really know what you're capable of unless you're in a situation like that, you know. If you only know one kind of lifestyle, you don't know what you can handle. And today, I think people take life too much for granted. Mm -hmm. We live in a period of abundance. All you need is money and everything is within reach. But that was not the case all the time. Right. So shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about your son, uh, Steve. Uh, <laughs> What did you think when he told you that he wanted to pursue a life in jiu-jitsu? Um, Stephen will never appreciate my opinion on that. <laughs> I told him, I said, why can't you take something tamer like uh, ping pong or uh, tennis? <laughs> I, I'm, because the first time I saw him in any kind of uh, physical in, uh, involvement was uh, like boxing, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I didn't give birth to anybody to be used as punching back, and I wish you'd find something m more civilized. I always thought that was a somewhat barbarian sport, mm -hmm. and he kept telling me that jiu-jitsu is different. It te teaches you how to respect life, and it's a way of defending yourself about really getting hurt, and he's done enough talking to convince me that it must be okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we talk about you know having some some difficulties in your life, and jiu-jitsu is very tough. You're, you're sparring against really tough guys, who are putting a lot of pressure on you, and so Steve definitely paid his dues, and and now he's a very successful teacher. So now, looking back, do you approve of his lifestyle choice? I guess I have to because it seems that this is his life now, and as far as I'm concerned. You know, I think every parent has dreams of what they'd like their children to become. But I have those same dreams, but I've also learned that you cannot live somebody else's life for them. So all I want from my children is whatever lifestyle you choose, just try to be the best in it, you know. There are few places in the world like Guam, and the warm hearts of the people here transcend its tiny footprint in the Pacific. The hospitality extended by the people here reminds me that the brotherhood of the Jiu-Jitsu community reaches far across cultures, language, and vast oceans. Though we may be from different teams or even different parts of the world, we all speak a common language, the language of Jiu-Jitsu.